One Hindu text says, it is by the rays of the sun that all creatures are endowed with vital breaths. Kumara Swami calls Nataraja the clearest image of the activity of God, which any art or religion can, spo can boast of. Nataraja, the clearest image of the activity of God, which any art or religion can boast of. Shiva as the cosmic dancer embodies the five activities of eternal energy. These are the five activities. Creation, preservation, destruction, veiling of true being behind maya or illusion, and liberation. The five activities are symbolized in the figure of Nataraja. Number one, creation. Number two, preservation. Number three, destruction. Number four, veiling of true being behind maya. And five, liberation. The first activity, creation, is symbolized by the drum shaped like an hourglass that Shiva holds with his upper right hand. Heinrich Zimmer explains that the drum connotes sound, the vehicle of speech, the conveyor of revelation, tradition, and divine truth. Furthermore, sound is associated with sound is associated in India with ether, the first of the five elements. Ether is the primary and most subtly pervasive manifestation of the divine substance. Out of it unfold in the evolution of the universe all the other elements. Together, sound and ether signify the moment of creation. End of quote. Two, the second activity, preservation, is symbolized by Nataraja's second right hand raised in the fear not gesture, palm facing outward. This gesture signifies protection and peace, as well as preservation. Stella Cramrish says, this hand of Shiva grants freedom from the fear of repeated births and deaths and assures the maintenance of life. Ayer says his gesture indicates the blessed calmness of wisdom. You see this formed, touching the center of the heart with your left hand, you can hold the palm flat, or you can bring the first finger and the thumb together in that motion of fearlessness. The third activity, destruction, is symbolized in the tongue of flame Shiva bears in his upper left hand. Ayer says the fire in Shiva's hand represents the light brought by the guru. Four, the fourth activity, veiling of true being behind maya, Maya or illusion is symbolized by Nataraja's dancing on the prostrate body of a demon called forgetfulness or heedlessness. This aspect of Shiva's dance signifies that ignorance has to be conquered in order to attain liberation. The ascended masters teach that Shiva is the great guru who comes to save you from ignorance, forgetfulness, and the human ego. His kindly love is also a fierce love that strips you of all that separates you from oneness with him. The next bhajan we sing is to Shiva as the guru, number 653, Hara Mahadeva. <clears throat> Let's stand and give I am presence, thou art master. Will you read it, please? And we'll begin. I am presence, thou art master. I am presence, pray your way. Let the light and all thy power, great possession, here is our. Shout your victories, master, you break your light, you raise your substance into this, like only said. Thy perfection and his glory shall blaze forth and earth transcend. I am present, thou art master, I am present, pray and wait. Let thy light and all thy power take possession, hear this hour. Shout your victories, master, 
Number 653, you're welcome to remain standing if that's comfortable. Begin. <coughs> Shankara Shri Bhutanatha 
I think we should make an appointment on a day or a night when we can give that mantra indefinitely. <laughs> we might solve all the world's problems in one night. <laughs> the fifth activity, liberation is symbolized by Shiva's raised foot. The raised foot signifies that Shiva is granting grace to his devotees and that man can raise himself 
and attain salvation. Some devotees see the uplifted foot as representing the bestowal of eternal bliss or union with the Absolute. The uplifted foot also represents the state of consciousness called Turiya. Turiya. Turiya is a Sanskrit word meaning the fourth. Turiya is called the fourth because it is the superconscious state of illumination that transcends the three familiar states of waking, dreaming, and dreamless sleep. One of the Upanishads describes the state of Turiya as pure unified consciousness, unspeakable peace, and the nature of the Atman. Shiva's uplifted foot thus signifies liberation from the spell of Maya or ignorance. You know, I find that the more enlightenment I receive or experience, the more I am aware of base ignorance in myself and others. Turning on the great light bulb of enlightenment will do that. And suddenly you become so aware of this thick, doughy substance of ignorance that you want to slice through it with the sword of Shiva and the sword of Archangel Michael and the sword of Astraea. Just cut through that ignorance that you begin to see everywhere that everyone is functioning in this maya and illusion. And so a little bit of enlightenment can cause a great displacement of all of one's forces and centeredness and all that one thought one was or might be or would ever be. When you really get that piercing sword of enlightenment and then see in what, what steep ignorance, layers of ignorance, the world is in. So an arch of flame surrounds Nataraja. Zimmer says that one of the allegorical meanings assigned to the halo of flames is that of the holy syllable Om. This mystical utterance is understood as an expression and affirmation of the totality of creation. He says that other interpretations of the flaming arch are that it signifies the transcendental light of the knowledge of truth and the vital processes of the universe and its creatures. I would like you to know that when you sound the Om, you should enter this sound. You can see sound as a funnel or any visualization that suits you. Sound going forth from you, the sound of the Om, goes home to the central sun, your point of origin, your divine source. So if you see yourself swimming in the sea of light and going to the central sun over the shaft of sound that you have created by sounding the Om, you can actually project yourself to that central sun and the central sun will project back to you the sound of the Om again. So what happens if you meditate upon the sun of Helios and Vesta as a reminder of just how great the magnitude of the great central sun must be, being so much greater than the sun of our system, you begin to have the establishment of a cosmic equation of yourself having come forth from this great central sun to this particular planetary home and that what ties you to Brahman and the word in the beginning and the point of your origin is the sound of the Om. It's wonderful to give that homing call. <clears throat> so I would like you to do it at this time. It's the funniest thing with these flats behind me. I keep getting this feeling that somebody's behind me the whole time. <laughs> I have to look around and see if somebody is wanting to tell me something. <clears throat> Give your diaphragm plenty of room by stretching up tall on your seat. <clears throat> Speak the Om from the seat of the soul chakra. Take a deep breath now.
Remember, there is no time and space. There isn't even any matter. And so when you sound the Om, it reaches the point of your visualization. That is why you need to have a very strong visualization of the point of light, the star, the home star of your origin. See the star in your mind's eye and then send the sound of the Om to that point. As you do this, when it comes to mind each day or as you wish, you will be building a momentum, strengthening the tie, ever strengthening it. The sound of the Om becomes the cord of light. Each time you sound the Om, it goes across the cord of light and the cord of light becomes stronger and stronger and stronger. And by that devotion of that cord, that great cord of light, you have that lifetimes of momentum centered in the Om to hold on to that rope so in the hour of transition, you need not trip and descend down the steps into the astral plane. Gautama Buddha has given us the teaching about the anchor. And we have the anchor on the end of a rope and we cast our anchor into the sun. And we lock it into the sun so we're continually traveling the rope to the heart of God and we have sent a part of ourself ahead of ourselves to that point of union. And that part of ourself is the power of the spoken word. And this word of the Om we endow with the sacred fire of our threefold flame and the reality that God has placed within our breast. So a portion of ourselves we send as a messenger going before us. And we hurl this mighty anchor of light into the sun strengthen the rope so that we can climb up the rope whenever is needed and ultimately when we make the transition to other worlds. Continuing with Shiva, as the third member of the Hindu triad, Shiva's role parallels that of the Holy Spirit in the Western Trinity. Shiva teaches that the threefold flame in your heart is the personification of Brahma, Vishnu, and Shiva. He says you can see those three plumes as ourselves personified. Then you may talk to us. We are not a three-headed God, but three in one, for we also have a threefold flame. This Shiva said in a dictation through me. It is well for a time to visualize us personally rather than simply as an impersonal flame that is burning. So if you look at the picture of the threefold flame, the three plumes, and you are giving your songs and mantras and prayers for the balancing of the threefold flame, you should visualize Brahma in the blue plume, Vishnu in the yellow, and Shiva in the pink. So you are not just worshiping a flame, but you are worshiping the ensoulment of that three-point flame by the Trinity. And so you can speak to Brahma, Vishnu, and Shiva as Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Then you begin to have the sense, I am one with Brahma, I am one with Shiva, I am one with Vishnu, I am one through the threefold flame in my heart. My heart flame is not simply an impersonal three flames that come together, but indeed the personification of the Trinity in my heart. It makes a big difference to start personifying the flame and seeing Father, Son, and Holy Spirit as your companions in the way of life. <clears throat> and so Shiva says, meditate on us not as statues or pagan gods, but as the very fire and the replica of the Godhead that has been placed in your heart. It is difficult to contain even for a moment the perception of just how profound is the love of God for us. We made the decision to descend lower than the octaves of perfection, to enter this world, to make karma, to then become incomplete beings, incomplete psychologically, incomplete in comparison to the great attainment and wisdom we once had. 
So we descended down and down the cellar stairs into the basements and sub-basements of the lower worlds, and here we find ourselves. And here is the love of God we have willfully separated out from God. So God takes himself, the replica of himself, in this trinity and places himself in our heart. Now what does God do when he does that? He makes himself a prisoner to us. We now hold him in our beings as prisoner. He has said, I will remain in this heart until this soul has passed from this screen of life and this flame returns to the level of the Christ. So for the sake of saving your soul, which can be lost, which is not a permanent identity in God until your soul is fused to the living Christ and to your I am presence, for the sake of saving your soul, God places himself surely uncomfortably in an imperfect world and in the imperfect circumstances of our everyday lives, night and day, round the clock, whatever we're doing, whatever our moods are, whatever way we decide to qualify the energy that is coming through us, there is God, the same Brahma, the same Vishnu, the same Shiva, yesterday and today and forever, that God is ablaze in our hearts, telling us each day, come to me, come to me, come and be one with me, and see how you will manifest that triad in the fullness of my glory. So God surely pursues us with great pain, with great pain. Being that is infinite and absolute in the realms of absolute light, that being, individual being, God-free being, experiences enormous pain to come to the level where we are now. And so God so loved the world that he sent his only begotten Son that the world through him might have eternal life. And he sent his Son not to condemn the world, not to condemn the people, not to put upon them that trip of sin, sinner, and sinful, damned forever. None of that. Not to condemn the world, but that the world might have eternal life. So anytime, anywhere you hear the preaching of false preachers who are in condemnation and talk, to, and talk about the damnation that results to those who sin, know that you are not in the place of the holiness of God, that you have strayed somewhere where there are those who insist upon condemning the children of God and the sons and daughters of God because somehow they have missed the divine spark in their own hearts, or perhaps even worse, simply snuffed it out because they are in fact anti-God in their own manifestation and they want to know God within themselves. So you beware the tones of condemnation coming from anywhere. It could come from those closest to you. Jesus said, thy enemies shall be they of thine own household. And so those who love you the most often deliver the sharpest, mo most painful sword. And you must remember that only God is real in you and only God is real in them. And therefore, do not be burdened, but understand that the path is the return by the way of comfort and compassion and eternal kindness of the Buddhas and the Bodhisattvas. And so return anything and everything that comes to you with a supreme effort to understand another, to help another, to heal another, to protect and care for another. Don't be concerned about yourself and how you are bruised or who bruises you. Be concerned to bind up the wounds of those who have the need to bruise you. And then go into your closet and pray for the binding of the dweller on the threshold and the cutting free of that one by your sword of blue flame from all influences of darkness that may be working in or through that person just to get at your light and your heart. God in you is immovable and you are one with that God. So do not be moved by whatever comes to you. Simply do not be moved. Shiva says that he is always near at hand to answer your prayers. He says, you do not need to call me with a long and loud call as if I were far away. 
Some people shout at me when they're standing next to me. <laughs> a simple signal will suffice. I am always ready. Turn your life around with me and I will show you my cosmic dance. And I will dance with you and whirl in the sphere of fire. Yes, I shall show you how imminent is your victory. Your victory is so close. It's like walk out of a dark room and enter a room of light. It is so close. It is so near. It is so wonderful. It is so there. I am here to tell you that your victory is not in the distant future. It's in the point in your heart right now where you say, I have decided this day and forevermore that no matter what comes my way, I will love, I will love, I will love 360 degrees of the circle. I will love whatever comes to me. I will love anyone, whatever they do to me, because all I can see in anyone is that blazing reality of Brahma, Vishnu, and Shiva in their hearts. And I will love that flame. And I will know liberation for all people through that flame. That is the key. That is all you have to do the rest of your life. You think you can do it? Yeah. I do too. I do too. Outsmart them all. Outsmart all those silly devils. Yes, I shall show you how imminent is your victory. Lord Shiva encourages, encourages you to try an experiment for overcoming negative habits. He says, give yourself a cycle to rise to a plane of greater dominion. Make a God determination. Think now of a very certain condition within your consciousness which you know absolutely must go. Think of that human consciousness. Think of that problem or habit that has gnawed at you and kept you from your eternal salvation for many lifetimes. Now, beloved ones, I ask you, be a scientist and try this one experiment for the next 48 hours. Each time you face that momentum, that memory, that consciousness, that habit or that desire, each time it crosses the line of the mind, the desire body, or your big toe, each time it comes into the memory, speak into it with a full ferocity of your voice. Shiva! 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 Remember to combine that effort with examining the points I made about weaknesses in the organs of the body and applying to them the necessary food to restore grace, harmony, and strength to those organs. Remember that these momentums and habits can be a weakness in some part of the physical body, and until you get to that weakness, you then are not able to fully, fully realize the Shiva presence within you. We have one final bhajan before we take a brief break for the dictations. Number 674. Jai Guru Omkara Jai Jai Sat Guru Omkara Yeah, get on cue this time. 
to him. Jai Guru Omkara Jai Jai Sad Guru Omkara Om Jai Guru Omkara Jai Jai Sad Guru Omkara Jai Guru Omkara Jai Jai Sad Guru Omkara slowly on bhajans any time. There's no matrix at this slow speed. Okay? Jai Guru Omkara Jai Jai Sad Guru Omkara Sadguru Omkara Oh Jai Guru Omkara Jai Jai Sadguru Omkara Oh Brahma Vishnu Sada Shiva Brahma Vishnu Sada Shiva Brahma Vishnu Sada Shiva Para 
Thank you very much, everyone, for a wonderful afternoon in the heart of Shiva. Please take a good break and come back for the dictations.